Oh, it'll be. There we go. Okay, over to you, Jonathan. The three principal gods of Hinduism are Brahma. Brahma is the creator. Vishnu is the preserver. Shiva is the destroyer. Um, so the middle figure is Shiva. The blue figure is Vishnu. And the one with three heads is Brahma. And they, it's an energetic system as much as a, a system of iconography. Next. The other religion, the main religions are Jainism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. So the founding figure of Jainism is Mahavira, and there are 24 Tinkavaras or fold crosses. The Jain images are close to the ascetic ideal of yoga. Ascetic. So it started in roughly the same time as Buddhism. Um, but it's, it's differentiated from Buddhism in quite a number of ways, but uh, the iconography looks very similar. Next. The, the dating pertaining to Buddha's life are uncertain, but he lived between 565 to 480 BC, he taught around 45 years, showing the way to become enlightened through meditation and ethical codes of practice, whether within a monastic context or as lay followers. So he tended to differentiate between uh, the lay uh, and the monastic. This is a Gandharan um, representation of the Buddha. This is second, third century, and shows the influence of Greek, Roman Greek, um, representational structures upon Indian. And the Buddha wasn't represented as a figure until around the time of Christ, first century AD. Um, before then, the Buddha was represented as an empty throne or a parasol or the Bodhi tree. So it, it was shown as a, a non, as iconoclastic, non, non-human figure. So it was, in fact, the earliest Buddhas came from, representation of the Buddha came as a union between Greek and Hinduist, Hindu art. Next. One of the main features of Indian ascetics is the concept of rasa. Rasa means tincture, flavor, implying tasting or essence. It's a plural condition such as terror, disgust, or love, all of which have consequences. In ascetic theory, there are eight main states with the ninth added later, but each state comes with the attribution of both color and presiding de deity. Next. So the earliest, one of the earliest um, empires is the Mauryan Empire, which is said to 2nd BC. And primarily the, there was small terracotta figures, which is on the left, and stone. Next. This is the Ashoka. This is one of the most important classical sculptures in Indian Indian subcontinent. Shows the four directions of the capital lion um, pointing in the four directions of the earth. Um, but the Ashoka was a, a king who forsake hunting and war and started to build these pillars, these capital pillars all across India as a sign of his devotion to, to Buddhism. Next. It's the next dynasty, which is called Shunga. 
the second to first century AD is a Yakshi figure. Next. This is a Sangha um, burial mound. The, often the um, is four, there's four different directions. You can see the sculptural figures around the gateways. It's called stupas. You can see on the top of the stupa is a parasol, which is a presentation of the Buddhist form. So it's pre, pre the um, representation of the Buddha. It's in Sanchi. Next. If you go to the British Museum in the Indian section, you'll see the remains of a lot of the Amravati stupa. It was developed between the third century and second century AD. The stupa traces the early stages in which the Buddha is recorded as an empty space becoming, and then becoming an invisible trace. These stupas were important gathering points for the Buddhist community. And it's where iconography is starting to cohere into a into a continuous process of representation and narrative. So it's a record of the Buddha's life. You've got to remember that mostly people were illiterate, so these visual artifacts served as guides to the narrative of the Buddha's life. Next. This is a stupa at Barut. This is Sangha period. This is at UP, Uttar Pradesh. So again, the miniature stupa. This is, again, Sunga. This is the surround of the stupa. So you get these abstractions, these circles, these um, almost like coins. Next. This is Sangha period. He actually, the small terracottas, very elaborate. Um, it's in Bengal. A lot of these were found in fields. So it felt that they had to do with fertility, both fertility and um, a kind of magical relationship to agriculture and fecundity. The, the female figure is all adorned with jewelry, is naked other than jewelry, and the headdresses are very elaborate. The, the jewelry you can see is resplendent. But in a sense, it points towards a deeply matriarchal culture. Next. So again, it's Sangha period. Shows a loving couple. So erotic depiction is common within this period of Indian art. Next. Kushan um, Empire, which went from 1st century AD, uh, AD to 4th century. 
This is a Yakshi figure. So again, it's much more refined and simplified than the previous period. So again, it emphasizes sensuality and the kind of meeting point between um, the bodily and the spiritual, and between fecundity and, I mean, it's both earth and air combined together. Next. This is Gen Kashan period. So on one side is the Buddha figure. Um, and a, a, a sort of scene from Bacchus, sort of intoxication. Yes. So this is Gandhara, and this is in what's the region of Pakistan and, in, and Afghanistan. But it stretches from the 1st century AD to the 6th century AD. And this is typical of the um, narrative scenes which were inherited from Alexander the Great went to India uh, on the edge of Afghanistan in his conquest, world conquest. And they left behind documents and Greek-speaking people and sculptors. And there's a fusion between Greek, Roman Greek art and Indian art. And this went these travels along the the, the 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 Silk Route to Central Asia and India. So workmen tended to work on caves in particular, and painters and sculptors would elaborate upon sort of these monastic outposts in caves and small monasteries all along the Silk Route. So of trade silks and ivories and special spices and pigments would travel backwards and forwards along the silk route, but they'd leave communities. These communities left the artifacts. So it was both this physical journey and a sort of spiritual journey, an aesthetic journey. The silk routes eventually spread all the way, connected from Japan to um, Constantinople. It went from Constantinople was to Venice, and from Venice, rest of Europe. So over the centuries, ideas and practices spread both ways. Next. Sorry, Jonathan, shall we send a message? She says she's in the waiting room. Can you let her in? Okay. Thanks so much. This is again Gandhara. So the earliest representation of Buddha was around the first century BC, AD. Previously, Buddha was presented as an empty throne, a parasol, a bodhi tree, or a footprint. He's uh, often up to life size, but distinctly Greek um, elements within the depiction. Next. 
It's under, under the great 4th century BC, extended the Greek Empire to North India and served to introduce Hellenistic aesthetic forms. So you actually get Greek sculpture, Greek representations in India. This is an image of Alexander. You find sculptures of Alexander in, in the region of North India, Pakistan or Afghanistan. So there's also a sort of meeting point between Greek philosophy and Indian philosophy. Next. It shows a, a sort of Greek influence on Indian uh, Gandharan. This is terracotta. You can see the glass eyes. The oh, sorry. The next great empire, the next is Gupta. This fourth to sixth century, and this is seen very much as almost the equivalent of the Renaissance of Indian art, the highest point. And this is a Central Asian, a Central Indian depiction of the Buddha, sort of life size. But what what is it? Is, could someone analyze the body, which was different from the Greek? What kind of body? It, it's not as defined as a Greek body. It's not got any muscles, has it? It's not got any architecture very soft so it's, it's both a physical it's not so much a gross physical body as an etheric body or what they call subtle body it's a body of energy and flows and it's got a parasol which indicates a relationship to the the rest of space and cosmology. That's very different from the Gandhara representations of the Buddha. Much more sensual, serene, death of this world. In a sense, this is the this this image of the Buddha is the image we retain of the Buddha, but it's it's almost a thousand years after the Buddha died to reach an ideal of the Buddha. Next. It's the Buddha um, fifth century in teaching pose. The Buddha would often do an abstract sermon who talk about the laws of the Buddha and causality and, and then give a story, an allegory perhaps. And then if he said, you don't understand anything, just sit thus, sit, sit in meditation and you'll understand. So he taught on three different levels, philosophically, abstractly, allegorically or narratively. And a doing a demonstration of what, sit in silence and just sit thus, and you'll understand. So he, he structured his congregation in different levels of understanding. The monasteries at this time also undertook studies in. Um, philosophically abstract ideas do with attention, particularly the nature of being. Yes. So the monasteries were also universities. 
to the Buddha head from the fist that is Gupta, highly stylized, elongated ears, all hearing, the almond like eyes, all seeing. Yes. Although predominantly India at this time was Buddhist, Hinduism was still very strong. And these are Gupta, this is Gupta Vishnu. The, the Buddha is a reincarnation in Hinduism. The Buddha is a reincarnation of, the, of Vishnu, the ninth reincarnation. There's 10 reincarnations, if I remember. It takes on, Vishnu also takes on the form of a fish. Um, it's a sleeping Vishnu. Thanks. Does someone read this? Kate? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Vishnu has 10 reincarnations, which are called avatars, each with a different form and purpose. The first is Matsya, the fish. The second is Kurma, the tortoise. The third is Varaha, the boar. The fourth is Naras Narasimha, the man lion. The fifth is Vamana, the dwarf. The sixth is Parayurama, the angry man. The seventh is Lord Rama, the perfect man. The eighth is Lord Krishna, the divine statesman. The ninth is Balrama, Krishna's elder brother. But a number of versions posit the Buddha, and finally the tenth is Kaliki, the mighty warrior. Kalki, the mighty warrior. So in Hinduism is very complex in terms of iconography. It's constantly in a state of metamorphosis and taking on different guises and breaking the spell of reality and illusion. Yes. He's again go up to terracottas. Yes. And this is, this is the Gupta period, but the Janta caves, which filled with sculptural and, and fresco, filled with frescoes and painted figures and sculptures. So the whole cave is an immersion into Buddhist iconography and reality. Next. So these were carved out of solid rock. So famously, a lot of the temples in India were carved out of solid rock. They, um, they're really interesting. I went to South India and went into some of these small cave dwellings or monasteries. And there's often two chambers, the entrance with iconography, and then there was a, a second entrance into a pure space, like a womb space. Mm. And they were like sonic chambers. So it's thought that there were so, as much as visual spaces, iconography, there were also sonic spaces. Next.
So this is Gen 2. And you get these, it's almost like paradisal depictions of the life of bodhisattvas, the Buddhist, Buddhist cos cosmology. Thanks. Again, Gupta. When is when was that one from? It's fifth century, fifth, sixth century. Mm -hmm. But they often were um two, three hundred years in construction. Next. So after the um, Gupta period, you get a period where it was called post-Gupta, 7th, 8th century. And one of the, uh, the, the period, periodization of Indian sculpture tends to be also in terms of distinct locations. So the parlor is northeast India, Bengal and Bihar, this 8th to 12th century. And you get the beginnings of incredible bronze sculpture, which went into the Himalayas and formed the basis of Himalayan art in Nepal and Tibet. This is Tara. Typically, the stone is a very black granite, black basalt stone. Very, almost like a, a metal in strength. Next. So this is Pala. Central figure is Vishnu. The Ganesha. Ganesha is the son of Shiva. And this is a famous example of Shiva and Parvati in love and embrace. Shiva takes on many forms, takes on the idea of destroyer. The, the dancer, Shiva Nataraja, uh, the consort, Shiva and Parvati. Thanks. Those are gilt, bronze, and bronze. These forms go into Him Him Himalayan art and Kashmiri and. Nepalese and Tibetan. Yes. Does someone read? Stella Kramrish in her book, Tradition of Indian Art, states that in, quote, Indian art, the figures are, as it were, modeled by breadth, which dilates the chest and is felt to carry the pulse of life throughout the body to the tips of the fingers. Works of art in India are known as existent, sorry, existent, vastu, and concrete, murti. They can be approached, comprehended, seen, and touched. Page 27. Yes. Is it medieval, 12th century? So you, you go from this very static early uh, modeling of iconography to a sort of more dynamic 
So an impossible convolution of the body. Yes. Raise it a bit. This is how Shila, which is built between the 11th and 14th century in central India. It's also, all, almost like in European terms, sort of Rococo. Yes. These are uh, Yogini figures. The, the, um, the small one, the small black stone is in the British Museum. Very powerful. There's a whole courtyard of about 20 yogini figures in a circle. Thanks. This is a Jain temple, Mount Abu. This is 11th, 12th century. You get these domes or mandala-like formations. Yes. This is Kajuara. Um, the whole temple structure is covered with scenes of erotic embrace. When the um, British colonized India, they were shocked to find these temples. They thought they must be a uh, heathen culture to complete eroticism with religion. Next. So this is Kujara. Next. And some very delicate observations, like this female figure um, making up the eye. Next. So, sculptured painting. Hello. 
Yeah, just the one above. Which period is that? The sculpture, the one above. Uh, this is approximately eleventh century. Eleventh century, and the same as the one before, right? Yeah, medieval, from tenth to eleventh century. Yeah, Sorry. it's really, it's a really contemporary sense. In what way is it contemporary? Um. You know, you see the the making up the eyes and also the down before really minimize the the figure and the decoration of their outfit. It's really contemporary, I feel like. Yeah. It's India one. It's Central India. This is Krishna stealing the clothing of the gopis. So Krishna is a reincarnation of Vishnu. But Indian miniatures were typically painted in, in books. So there's a text, um, as well as paintings. Next. This is Bisholi, Punjab Hills of 17th century. The great colorists. Next is Shiva in the um, graveyard. So it absorbs the dark energy of the, the burial burial places, as well as meditates in the Himalayas, as well as does his sacred dance in the south of India. Next. It's a Jain manuscript of different worlds. So a mapping of the cosmos. Next. Yantra is a term for an instrument designed to focus the mind on the pattern or static vision of a divinity. Mantra comes from man to think. is an instrument for producing something in the mind. Next. The Jain Yantra. Next. This is what's called the subtle body and the chakras. So there's seven main chakras. And um, they ref they're sort of centers of energy and of consciousness. So consciousness isn't is a bodily as much as a, a mental ideation. And yoga is Kundalini yoga is the development of the the synchronicity between the cosmic centers. So it's the interface between the body and the world.
and each chakra has a main color, a main divinity, and a frequency. So as the, the chakras develop outwards, the frequency becomes more and more subtle. Yeah, I've been doing a um, uh, a number of uh, singing-based um, practices over the last few months, and um, <clears throat> a couple of those, you know, centre on this sort of uh, so-called octave of consciousness, where you know you direct your attention um, to each of the chakras in turn um but sing a particular frequency uh for each one that ascends um as you move up through um up through the body and it's it's really quite a powerful exercise i mean there's lots of ways of doing it as you say sometimes it you know you can just <clears throat> uh focus on the color um or you know focus on the sound or move your hand across your body so that you're just you know um i think what's common to them all is is this uh is this giving of attention um so this focused mental state um on a particular area of the body and whether you're using you know sound or color or the um you know the the sign or image of that particular chakra um you know it's it's almost kind of irrelevant is you know what what is um, more significant to you um to focus on um but but the practice of doing it is you know is really quite it's really quite strong actually it it um you know it definitely has uh physiological emotional and you know uh spiritual um effects if it's if it's done as a regular practice it also had a big impact in terms of european culture around the uh, early part of the 20th century through figures like madame pavasky and uh, indirectly it influenced kandinsky in particular to understand the in the dynamics of color and vibration of color and an abstract symphony of colors and forms. So Blavatsky and, no, not Blavatsky, um, Annie Besant and Led Bella did a, a book called Thought Forms, which is based partly on Indian physiology is a subtle body. Next. Someone read. Shall we have someone new? Uh, I can go. Um... The subtle body consists of chakras, which are the focal points of a vast network of nardic channels that channel prana. In most theories, there are seven main chakras. The combined practices of meditation, breath control, recitation of mantras, mudras, and yogic practices serve to channel the energetic disposition of the body to yoke cosmic extension. So the, the idea is, is to open up the body to the, to higher energies. Next. It's a great image. <laughs> uh, a page from a 19th century yoga manuscript. Rather than representing the physical body, it, it is a diagram of the subtle or etheric body that links the body to the forces of the cosmos. Tantra at its root means to weave. So in this case, it is the weave of forces that is at play in the world. Tantra is an esoteric system of knowledge whose design is to transform and to save. 
So one of the translations of Tantra is knowledge that saves. I mean, we tend to just hear of Tantra as being a form of sophisticated sexual practice. Um, but it's a form of esoteric, it's called left-handed Buddhism or Hinduism. It's simply secret knowledge. Next. So South India is in many ways distinct from Northern India and has a different um, set of dynasties, many of the Pallava and Chola dynasties. Next. They were tremendous stone builders. Yes. This is a part of a rock carving. And uh, in the central figure is a yogic figure. You can see a female figure giving birth. I've seen this temple. It's what carving is incredible. Mm. Is that the female body connected with a snake in the left? Yeah. So you get all sorts of mutations and hybridities and metamorphosis. The whole relationship between different levels of energetic systems and natural systems all, all create a union of energy. Next. So it's just... Uh, rock carving, but incredible sense of narrative. Next. This is the way, one of the most important single figures in Indian art, the dancing Shiva, Shiva Nasharaja. So it represents five activities of creation, preservation, destruction, bailing, and release. So the um, right hand beats out the hour drum, the birth of time. The left hand is of cosmic fire. So it's the birth of time and the, the end of the world. You've got the flames of creation and destruction. One hand pointing up is release. Do not fear. The hand pointing downward is points the foot, which is in expansion. One, one ear is female, one ear is male. In the headdress is the moon and the sun. Beneath the feet, is the um, lotus flower, the dwarf of ignorance is crushed beneath the feet of Shiva. But very often from the headdress, the river Ganges runs. So you get all the elements of the earth. And these 
would often be taken through parades in different festivals or the streets and then put back into the monasteries. But it's one of the greatest sculptural achievements in world art. So this is 10th, 11th century. Next. Someone read. Dancing is a form of ancient magic. The dancer becomes amplified into being endowed with supranormal powers. Like yoga, the dance induces trance, ecstasy, the experience of the divine, the realization of one's own secret nature, and finally emergence into divine essence. Thanks. This is again his children. Stephen Pavarotti. Next. This is your shoulder in the infinite Krishna. This, I think, is a metropolitan New in New York. Yes. These are Shiva Lick Lingam stones. So it's literally the abstraction of male and female energy. Often in the temples, there's a huge lingam at the center in, in this black space with no light, natural light. You just have this huge lingam, like an egg shape. Next. So besides the Jain, Buddhist, Hindu religions, you also have the Mughal Empire, the dominance of the Muslim. Muslims come from Central Asia. Um, and so conquer the whole north of India. The main emperor is Akbar, who is a great unifier. Akbar is interesting. He, he couldn't read and write, and yet loved storytelling. He, he had people making books of different creatures of the world, different animals, different birds, different flowers. Um, as well as different historical moments of his reign. So he had enormous workshops making jade and rock crystal, textiles, paintings, carpets. Decorative stone panels next so it's akbar akbar the great but he actually tried to bring about the synthesis of religions he was fascinated by he got jesuits to talk about the bible in his court Europe, there was the Jesuits brought illustrations from Renaissance art and some paintings. So 
Mughal paintings of fusion between Hindu, European, and Persian. Next. This is typical of the interiors of Mughal. Um, Next. That was the silk carpet in the 16th, 17th century. Some of the finest weaving in the world at that time. This is a jolly screen. Abstract geometrical configurations. Sort of endlessly self-generating pattern. Is, is this the date of the carpet that's in the v &A, that's under lights? Yeah, that's Safavid. This similar period, is, the Safavid is, is a bit earlier, 16th century, this is 17th century, but roughly the same period. And quite often the, the Jali designs were done in marble and it, it's meant to be the first type of cooling agents, like almost like air conditioning. So quite a lot of the mogul style buildings had the inner courtyards with water and that was another cooling cooling system used with marble. I mean, they built fabulous gardens and to build these gardens, they had to have irrigation systems, very sophisticated irrigation systems. They transfer them. The Muslims transform the south of Spain agriculturally, made it abundant, and with their understanding of irrigation, water control. Next. This is Jahangir. There's a great collection of Mughal artifacts in the V&A. Wonderful miniatures and artifacts. Jade and rock crystal. Vessels. Next. And they did great encyclopedias and um, chronicled all the creatures of the world. So you often get uh, the artists, some of the artists specialize in bird painting or flower painting. Next. Is an artist called Manso. So he painted the animal, someone else would paint the surround, the flowers in the album, leaf around. Next. I want to read. Mughal decorative arts are distinguished by exquisite craft. Workshops specialized in carving in jade, rock crystal, precious stones, silk, alabaster, fine wool, and marble. 
The scale of this production attracted makers from surrounding countries, so there was a process of synthesizing craft forms. There's a great period of synthesis of surrounding world culture. Next. This is in the V&A, in Shah Jahan's wine cup. So they, they originally imported jade from China, but began to source jade for themselves. And had a very, this is a very essential. I mean, jade is only carved through friction. You can't actually physically carve it with metal. You've got to use friction techniques. So it's a miracle of carving, very fine, very elegant. Next. This is jade with inlaid precious stones and semi-precious stones. The 17th century. Next. Oh, that's it. That's the last one. Yeah. That was a rapid, two, two, practically 2,000 years. But it gives a different timeline for cultural ascendancy and synthesis. And Certainly vastly different sort of um, priorities on or concepts of how the human life should be lived or presented or what should be given hierarchy, sort of forms of sensuality and experience uh, and the body beyond the body, as opposed to the, I, I'm thinking specifically of the medieval period, you know, as the West enters this very um, restricted. It's somewhat repressive as well. Uh, and the uh, the idea too of the you know uh, fluid gender identity of so many of the Hindu uh, deities and sub 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 deities, <laughs> many arms, many genders, many everything's ears, different gendered ears. Mm. I found the sculpture very interesting to me because uh, uh, I think I agree the lines are very different compared with the Western sculpture. And it's feel like a bloom that is blown by the air or the breeze inside. And especially uh, looking at the maps after the sculpture, and I feel like, uh, like everything is connected with each other. I feel it's keep transforming during the process and the um, lines connected with lines and the space connected with space. I like There's a different, it. There's a different cosmology in which yeah. all things connect. Yeah. And I found that there's a lot of like repetition in like pattern and the map and uh, and also some sculptures, they, they keep using the repetition to like drive people into this kind of cosmo. Yeah, it's a reminder of everything returns to the same. Yeah. There isn't a drive towards pro progress.
did they also play with some like conceptual ideas? Because I noticed that some of the images, for example, the one, uh, I think at the uh, middle of your presentation, it says the three cosmics, but actually in that picture, it's quite even. I would, I could see there's a four different directions is point through by the arrows, but the, the title of that image is called Three Cosmetics. Uh, no, no, cos Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to make those <laughs> mentions. <laughs> I was just thinking, Jonathan, of what you said about a drive toward progress and so that like a different kind of drive toward progress, a different concept rather than, uh, you know, technology equaling or or, or um, I don't want to say change because I think change toward clarity or change toward, I don't know, uh, sameness or sameness as a, as a method of uh, release is different than this idea of technological process or progress happening in um, like the industrial revolution. I was sort of contrasting the um, evenness of the folds of the cloth as a repetition um, from what, what somebody had said earlier about the sameness in the repetition in the sculpture. So even in the folds that there's that rhythm. Mm. Oh, Jessica's watching the eclipse. Put your glasses on. That's why her screen is black. <laughs> Cause she's smarter than Trump and she won't look right at it. Yeah. Can you, Jonathan, can you talk a little bit about this um, idea of these lingam stones that are in the middle of the temples, especially when you're talking about this sort of, I'm loving this notion of this sort of male, female, abstracted sort of form that's, that's um, a, combining both of the energies and then it's sitting in a sort of darkened space in the middle of the temple? Yeah, you get the centre of the temple is a, is a cosmic egg or lingam stone. And it's, it's without any differentiations. It's just pure singularity. Um, very powerful. You're literally in this just candlelight space. You see this shimmering stone. And it draws you into this dark interior, into a kind of void. It's, it's both there and it's not there. It's both actual and it's virtual. I mean, you're literally cut off from all uh, other sensory connection. It's a, it's a deep, throbbing space. Also went to a, a temple where they were performing a, a ritual of this this, um, this uh, rock crystal lingam stone, which was passed from one part of the temple to the other. Um, very mysterious, a thousand year old ritual, which is unbroken. I, I was, um, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you about the thought forms that you mentioned um, briefly, the subtle bodies you were saying and the colors that people use. Um, did Susan Hiller use that sort of thing to create sort of the images, auras from people? I know she'd be interested in, in that earlier uh, period of modernism and sort of mystical turn in modernism. 
I mean, Mondrian, Kandinsky, Malevich, um, we're all reading, um, even um, Duchamp was reading uh, esoteric texts from the East and uh, synthesis between Eastern and Western mysticism, mm. which Blavatnik um, was the main conduit for. And then Rudolf Steiner. So they had a Blavatsky and Steiner had this immense influence on early abstraction. I mean, early modernism tended to re represent the um, the rational side of abstraction to do with the scientific fourth dimension. But there's another idea of fourth dimension, which was mystical. Yeah. It's all news to me because I was, I'm a Buddhist and um, some of it was quite interesting what you were saying because in Sri Lanka you could see all the soup, um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the mount, the soup, uh, and you, you could see all the, the different forms. And, and then you have the tree, the main, the tree is like the temple. Mm. Bodhi tree. Well, the Buddha achieved his enlightenment beneath the Bodhi tree. Yeah. But they don't necessarily have pictures of him. It's later on that they, you know. It's the first they... century, five centuries after his death, he's represented. So no one knows what the Buddha looked like. It's a memory trace, an ideal depiction but he traveled a lot the buddha yeah so, so he, he traveled a lot and he came to sri lanka twice what's up well, it's quite timely to have some eclipse energy for this mm -hmm. conversation. <laughs> I'm sending it through. How was it? <laughs> it's only it's only partial where I am. Uh, I can't see that it's not total um, here, but you can see it's like it's definitely the lights drop quite a lot. Um, so yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Jonathan, um, oh, um, I was, sorry to in, interrupt. I was, I was going to um, maybe it's related, I, I suppose, in a way to an eclipse of uh, sort of seeing something through its kind of absence or something. But um, Jonathan, in your talks about Chinese art, you've um, mentioned a difference as you as you. Um, understand it between Greek art, which is very focused on presence, and Chinese art, which also has um, the interest to attempt to represent or to um, gesture towards absence. And that was very, uh, you know, um, came across as well in, in your talk about Indian art. And, and so I, you know, I understand there's a shared heritage of Buddhism. Um, and then the presence of that Greek influence seems to um, prompt the presence of the representation of the Buddha, for example. But after hearing your presentation on Chinese art, I was just wondering what might, um, if it's even possible to think about why there is that kind of um, dichotomy, what it was about Greek or potentially even Mediterranean culture that either wasn't thinking about absence or was kind of scared about the idea or fearful of the idea of nothingness. And I was thinking that, you know, from my limited understanding, the, num the number zero was 
It's Indian. Was, was was something that came from India and wasn't present in in the West until it was it was brought to Europe by Arabic mathematicians. So I don't know. I was just wondering. You know, maybe it's almost too ancient to even kind of consider. But what if you had any thoughts on that sort of divide between between a between say a, a Greek interest in presence and a and a and a Indian and, and potentially even Chinese interest in absence. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about Chinese Buddhism is it's also a mutation with Taoism. So it, it takes a more abstract turn in China. It's less to do with um, teaching of um, from scriptures. And it's much more a sort of practice, a, a, a transmission through direct understanding. So a lot of the painters were painter priests or painter monks. Um, so they gestured towards enlightenment. It was it was soundless and um, it was free of representation, representational structures. So. I mean, sometimes it gets to Japan, you get Zen, which is almost uh, with the Enso form. Um, a depiction of, I mean, a, a one second drawing, which is everything. Um, so everything comes out of emptiness and goes back into emptiness in Zen teaching. Um, I guess with Greek philosophy, it um, doesn't have the same relationship to mystical ideas. It's more rational. So it's born out of rationalism, the idea of presence. And out of ideal forms. Hmm. And do you think that's what precipitated the um, sort of personification of, of Buddha? It's quite interesting that there was a concept of Buddha before there was an image of Buddha and whether there was ever an idea that it was like it was coming but it wasn't personified yet or whether that was superimposed later and if so, where did it come from? It was definitely iconoclastic. Definitely, um, the Buddha shouldn't be depicted as a human. Mm. Should be depicted as an abstract law. So it's a different idea of abstraction. But then that was overcome at some point or dispensed with. I mean, I think it had something to do with the also emergence of Christianity. I mean, Christianity is quite late. I mean, they, they all share, monotheistic religions all share a relationship to the sun. But Jonathan, you're talking about abstraction, but I guess if you think um, Islamic art then was abstracted and not shown the figure, and then uh, Judaic, Art was not showing, I guess, the, was not the figure or representational. So, I mean, there'd be a lot of similarities in that, that respect, I would have thought. Mm. I mean, uh, iconoclasm is persistent within uh, Western culture anyway. I mean, the, mon the sacking of the monasteries is iconoclastic. And what? What does iconoclastic mean exactly, Jonathan? Construction of icons. <clears throat> but how does that relate to representation? I mean, representation is um, is not iconoclastic. Mm. I mean, representation. I mean, representation is 
that there's a presence of something. There's a trace of some presence. Like an icon which, being which, more... Which can have a stable, a stable identity. Yeah, it's really... Uh, analogy um, and correspondence and... I was going to say like an icon is more like a signifier for the for the concept of the thing like the container right and then the the a representation is attempting to capture some sort of an essence of the thing itself so maybe the you know the icon um stands in yeah stands in for concept and it's more like a, more like a got the idea in, in Hinduism the world's illusion, everything's illusion. So it's abstract, it's nothing, goes back to nothing. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? You get this idea of um, uh, in Greek thought the idea of um, the essence of something as, as you mentioned and representation maintaining that essence um, the trace of the thing is always visible even underneath the mask and as opposed to that you get this idea of um i don't know the cave within the cave or the mask there's nothing behind the mask you can Strips uh, pull all the masks off, but you will still not find the essence of the thing, um, which is exactly what Platonic philosophy was trying to prevent or objected to. Um, so um, that kind of was the opposite of, or that was was something that the Greeks were trying to suppress, at least early Greek philosophy. And I don't think they carried on after the Stoics or something, but early but Platonism would be trying to maintain this I the idea. Um and it might myth be mythological, but it's definitely not an icon. They would um be against the icon because it wasn't representing the idea or the essence of something. Mm. It's really, it's, you know, it's really actually helpful um, reflection to me. So I was, I was at a, um, the Sumaya Museum in Mexico City, um, and uh, <clears throat> um, they had this real kind of like uh, hodgepodge of um, art from all different time periods and all around the world, and. Um, you know, just sort of placed right next to each other. So um, you had some really ancient um, Mexican figurines, um, you know, right next to like 20th century uh, depictions, female, you know, female figures. And like, and, and the, the sort of, just sort of seeing them so close to each other you know it's just so um so like shockingly obvious the difference in the um the i guess just like the feeling or the character of these um of these figures and in in the more sort of modern depictions there was like this there was this kind of like sexualization and also, you know, the kind of uh, the gaze and the, you know, the male gaze in particular. And, you know, and you could, that was sort of one level, but it was also, there was also kind of like a difference in self-awareness. Um, so in the later sort of depictions, like the, it was like, the figure was aware that it was being observed um and there was a it was a kind of a self-awareness like as though that figure was a present thing um and so it's really interesting thinking about that 
in the context of this conversation because, um, you know, I suppose that's like another way of looking at it rather than, you know, like the 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 gays is you know what what were these figures trying to represent in the first instance was it a was it a present person or was it a you know a reference to um to something other you know and i was just uh, jotting down a few of your comments as you were um going through jonathan and and this idea of these um you know, earlier figures of being less of this world, um, you know, and it's almost like being defined um, precisely by its otherness rather than by its relatedness to us, you know, um, and that the more the more present the figure becomes, um, the, the more relatable it becomes and like the somehow this kind of, um wonder of observing something that's other than you um kind of collapses um and and it's and it and it loses to me is something um so it's really it's really interesting just sort of thinking about it from this you know other perspective of you know this you know iconoclastic versus representational um and and interestingly mexico um was another place uh where even before india they had a concept of zero um uh so yeah it didn't it didn't feed into the you know the evolution in the west but but it was also a concept here um so i think it's yeah just um really interesting to observe that that apart from these kind of like external factors of how the figure is represented and interpreted and what it means in society is perhaps like a, a much more fundamental level you know what was the purpose um what was what was the figure intended to um represent in the first instance so even where you have a figure uh it's not it's not a it's not a figure in which there's a feeling of a of a living presence um staring back at you it's something quite other than that i mean the other thing about zero is that it did come to the west earlier but they couldn't get it they thought you can't take nothing from nothing it's impossible so they refused the metaphysical basis of the idea of zero. They couldn't comprehend it intellectually. Mm. We've overrun the time. Who is going to present today? Uh, it's going to be me. I can do a quick run through or we can save it for another time, whichever we want. Let's do it next week. Uh, as I, I, I think I'm, I might have to go to New York next week, so I might have to defer. Yeah. Uh, could, could you run through in 15 minutes or is that a travesty? Well, I wouldn't say it's a travesty, but it's a little bit quick. So maybe just to do it. Yeah, time. let's give him a bit more time, I think. Yeah. But I think that there was somebody, there was a couple of people lined up. Vonda was going to do it, I think. Uh, somebody else was going to, to uh, present. Um, Is it Alex? Oh, yes, Alex, of course. Oh, we can nominate him because he's out of his seat for the moment. So... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think I was thinking of doing a, a, a quick presentation or just generating a discussion about drawing. In because that'll be a forerunner of the the trip to the Ashmolean. If that's 
Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I'll cut it down. I won't make a, a, a long presentation. Oh, okay. So any last points? We've not resolved the um, the big question of all culture is why why presence and why absence? No, but it's been very helpful um other way to it's another lens to um think about it because like there is a you know a profound visual shift um in in how that figure comes across, you know, and so um yeah, I think it's it's been helpful for me anyway to have another another way of thinking about why that shift occurred. I think over the next 20 years there'll be amazing reevaluation of different cultures and a refocusing upon cultural patterns outside of Western schemas. I think we'll be much more open to different systems of thinking and making and being in the world. But are you getting a sense of that, Jess, from your Mexican perspective, looking back? No, sadly not. It's it's really, um, you know, they think that there's like a, it feels like the predominant, uh, you know, force at the moment is to is to dissociate from that past, um, you know, and I think that that's got a lot to do with colonialism, racism in general, um, you know, a feeling that being a kind of second class citizen in the world um, and wanting to distance themselves from that past in order to be seen as modern and forward looking. Um, so, you know, and it's not everywhere. It's it's very different in different parts. Where I am now seems to be, um, you know, better connected to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, you know, there's certainly a tendency like not really to um, invest in their past or to be particularly interested in uncovering its um secrets you know and you know and like this is it's just a point in time right um so <clears throat> perhaps it will come um full circle again but yeah my sense at the moment is that predominantly there's this quite a strong suppression of all of that which is yeah it's interesting but maybe it has to go through that phase before it can come out the other side. <laughs> it's like the teenager, isn't it? You know, you have to dissociate yourself from your parents for a while and, <laughs> and then eventually you come back around at some point and realise it wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> and you open your mouth and things that sound like your mother come out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. Okay, I think we'll call it a day. Yeah. Hi, Tora. Okay, well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, thank I'll you, Jonathan. I'll try and work out what my computer has re reconfigured, and nothing works in the same way. <laughs> so it's bemusing me. I hate the system changes. Yeah, uh, nightmare. It have used to, so just used to be two buttons and you're in. <laughs> 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 mm. Okay, good night, anyway, all. Thank you. Thank you.